Oof, we're living at the bleeding edge of Tensor. <laughs> welcome, welcome, I'm so glad you're here. We have a lot of ground to cover. Now before we jump in, this is part two of our look at Pixel Performance. I'm working with my buddy TK Bay on this and he's sharing his experiences, focusing a bit more on things like gaming and media. Part one of this combination video is linked in the description down below. Now we're about to get proper nerdy with some numbers, looking at real world apps. As a brief starter, I don't particularly value benchmarking apps like Geekbench and Antutu. I don't believe these scores always predict how your phone will really work on the apps you use. I know we always want some overly simplistic single number score to see if a phone is gooder or badder, but that's not really how any tech works. So if you're curious how I've been testing phones for the last, what, four years, I have a link to my review guide also in the description down below. Google is making their own SOC and Tensor is an interesting animal. It's a unique combination of CPU and GPU hardware with a heavy focus on AI and machine learning. Increasingly, their consumer-facing software is heading in that machine learning direction. Still, we have a whole collection of productivity and content creation apps that someone might be interested in using on this phone. So we got to dig into these results. This chip is extremely new. When I say bleeding edge, I mean like right at the beginning of the first slice. That's a terrible metaphor. So there are a lot of third-party apps that are going to take a while to catch up here. This is where we start that conversation. This is not a conclusion. We shouldn't really expect conclusive reviews during an embargo week, but I digress. Now, I do want to start off with Geekbench just to get a baseline, and we see respectable CPU scores, pretty solid for single core performance. There's a lower multi-core score than many similarly priced phones launched this year. But at present, Android 12 seems to tank the GPU bench, not just here, but on all of my other pixels. So it currently crashes, so we can't see how this GPU lines up against uh, most of the Android 11 phones out on the market today. Getting into our first real test, video editing and rendering. Now this is a complex video project with transitions, a watermark, and a soundtrack. This test is for folks who want to finish off a nicer video for public publishing on YouTube. The Pixel 6 is falling behind the premium tier pack, but still delivers a respectable time. Uh, we just hope to see a render time that's faster than the project takes to play. And the Pixel 6 tackles that perfectly. As a brief aside, the phone that currently leads the pack on this test is the Pixel 4 XL on Android 12. Software optimization is critically important, and not even the fastest, newest, mostest, powerfulest phones have been able to catch this two-year-old Pixel. If you watched any reviewers complaining about the Pixel 4 Geekbench scores, they missed a phone that was a monster at chewing up video and has kept getting faster with age. But I digress again into a simpler transcode test, just taking one video file and cutting the bitrate in half. The Pixel 6 scores the fastest render time I've yet recorded. This is interesting. How a video editing app calls plugins and layers effects, the Pixel is a little slower for complex projects, but looks like it'll be one of the fastest options for doing simple edits and cuts to one video file. Record a single video file for your family and friends, trim the beginning, trim the end, and the pixel should be a screamer. It is worth pointing out here that, unfortunately for my testing, PowerDirector does not currently support Tensor. So my projects and my files there, they don't complete. Every render I've tried crashes. This kind of sums up how new this chip is and also how much room there is for apps to improve and optimize for this new hardware. Moving on, our podcast mix down test is encouraging. Two tracks of audio with bumpers and ads mixed down to an MP3. Audio Audio Evolution really likes the newest Qualcomm SoC, and it looks like Audio Evolution also likes Tensor. This is an hour-long audio project that finishes off in just over a minute. Our phones are shockingly powerful, and there are very good reasons someone might want to record, edit, and produce an audio project on the road all from a phone. Say you want to record an interview on the go. This is really easy to use and so much more discreet than a laptop 
or some kind of portable recorder. We've been having beautiful cloud cover all afternoon and the sunset just came piercing through and completely changed up my exposure on this camera. On to a more computer retest RAR compression, the Android app has a built-in benchmark that can also be compared against their PC application. The synthetic score lands somewhere in between the scores from phones launched in 2019 and 2020. And we shouldn't be too surprised about that given the configuration of the Pixel CPU cores. Running a larger compression test, the timed results also land about a generation behind the current fastest phones. As a point of reference, Google delivers better performance than Samsung's Galaxy S21 using the Galaxy's out-of-the-box CPU throttling. Samsung includes a higher performance enhanced mode buried in the battery settings. But the way most folks are probably using their Samsungs, the Pixel slots in with a faster score. On to my most brutal test, batch processing 200 raw photos from a Sony mirrorless camera. This test isn't just to see how fast, but also to test thermal throttling. It's such a hefty job, we should expect some kind of performance degradation. We can time the first 100 photos and compare that against the time it takes to process the second 100 photos. The Pixel 6 scores similarly to some of the phones from 2020. This is very good, if somewhat behind phones like the OnePlus 9 Pro. The Pixel also maintains respectable performance, dropping about 8% from batch to batch. The OnePlus 9 drops around 9%. A Galaxy S21 in enhanced mode only loses about 5%, but finishes the test significantly hotter to the touch. That last point is very important. The Pixel completes most tests in a similar fashion to phones that rein in thermals a little bit better. Some of the results from the Vivo X70 Pro Plus were also surprisingly slower, but both phones finish all of these tasks in reasonable times. I've got a couple other thoughts on practical use. The camera is very well behaved. I've got about high 70 degrees in my office and I easily recorded a 4K 60 frame per second video for over 25 minutes with no indication of thermal throttling or any performance warnings. It easily could have gone longer, I just got bored. Network and radio management has been encouraging too. Not using a Qualcomm SoC might make someone anxious about the radios. Now I'm on Mint using T-Mobile's network and 5G speeds have been better on my Pixel than on my OnePlus 9 Pro. Ditto Wi-Fi 6 connections. Like the Vivo I recently mentioned, I can pull files from my NAS and Google is making excellent use of my local network. And while TK is going to focus more on gaming, I was happy to see pretty consistent frame rates for a challenging title like Undead Horde. Now, this is a game that can cause some Snapdragon phones to choke on all the unit management. The flip side, I was super bummed to see Dead Cells crashing, as it's one of my favorite games to play on a phone, and it's incredibly well optimized for most other phones. Okay, we're we're landing this plane. Don't worry, we're 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 almost at a runway. How should we interpret these kinds of results? How should we feel about Google's first ever custom chip? Shouldn't we be concerned about Tensor not having the bestest Geekbench score? I think we're doing pretty good. Everything in consumer tech is a balance of different features and power, and in the case of this SOC, literally physical space. Google is looking to prioritize machine learning, on-device transcription, ever-improving camera and HDR performance, a number of services and AI options I cannot as reliably test, but they should make a phone feel like a more ubiquitous companion. <laughs> Literally a cloud of services that follow you around and they streamline your interactions throughout your day. But switching CPU configurations made me more than a little bit nervous. My worry with Tensor was Google dedicating more power and space to that machine learning hardware and we'd maybe find more severe compromises for traditional compute situations. Switching a processor is a really big deal. It's often not a better or worse kind of thing, but a how is it different? kind of deal. Like the companies that use Qualcomm and MediaTek processors in their current products, they have to do a lot of work balancing all of the differences between those SOCs so that those gadgets 
feel similar. Google handily arrives at a performance tier well above daily driver needs, even if it isn't slingshotting to the top of our benchmark charts. You gotta be driving your phone to laptop replacement use to start seeing the differences. And happily, that's not the computing claim that Google is making. If I want a phone to use as a mobile production camera, I might lean more Sony or Vivo. If I want a phone to be more of a laptop replacement, we can chat about a Surface, Samsung, or Moto for productivity features and great desktop modes. Google's take on this phone is highlighting ambient computing. Your phone as a companion. That's harder to measure, but I'm happy we don't see significant compromises to get there. The Pixel 6 doesn't win many performance sprints, but it's a sure-footed performer, and I think it has quite a bit of room to grow as we wait for more developers to update apps and better support this hardware. We're only at the very, very beginning of talking about this phone. Google's claims aren't the kind we measure in the first week of use. You know, we need to see how Google supports supports and updates and improves the Pixel 6 over time before we can properly judge how effective this hardware strategy might be. I think it's going to be a fun ride. Stay tuned for camera deep dives, audio reviews, some comparisons. I've been dying to pit the Pixel 6 Pro up against the Vivo X70 Pro Plus. I think that's going to be brutal. And of course, please make sure you check out TK Bay's video on his early testing, and I'll have that linked below. Give it a watch. It's, it's just a more complete conversation about where this phone might take us. As always, thanks so much for watching, sharing, subscribing. Huge thank you to those of you who are checking out the links in the description below these videos. Maybe you're shopping a little merch. That kind of stuff really does help keep production rolling on this channel. Full list, all my affiliates and partnerships on somegadgetguy.com, or you might consider, just maybe, joining the list of names scrolling by on your screen from my Patreon, patreon.com slash somegadgetguy. This list is basically a collection of the coolest tech pals on the planet, and they're going to be in line for early access on a lot of my audio and camera deep dive discussions. They're pretty awesome, so I hope you'll check them out. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet, at somegadgetguy on the Twitters and the Twitch, and the Facebooks and the Instagrams, and I will catch you all on the next video.